Hi, my name is uh, Guy Royce. I'm a developer advocate here at Redis Labs. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Bloom filters. And you're probably wondering, what the heck is a Bloom filter? That was my thought when I first heard of these things. And so several Googles and educations and codings later, I learned what they are. A Bloom filter is a, what we call a probabilistic data structure. And a probabilistic data structure is, um, well, it's kind of like um, a TARDIS and kind of like a JPEG. It's like a TARDIS in the sense that it's bigger on the inside. So there's more space on the inside than the outside. If you're a proper nerd, you'll know that. If you're not, you should watch Doctor Who and you can learn a little bit from it. And it's like a JPEG in the sense that it's a bit lossy. When you've got a JPEG, you put data into it, but not all the data is in that JPEG. Some of that data is lost, but it's lost in a way that doesn't matter. It doesn't diminish the value that you get out of having JPEG. It still looks like what it is as a picture. And um, you might be wondering, why do we want to have these things? Well, it's the reason we have the JPEG is because they save space. And we also can get some performance out of these things. And so they can be faster and they can take up less space. So this is why we would want to use a probabilistic data structure. Uh, we abbreviate this P11C because it takes forever to write probabilistic. It's even kind of hard to say, honestly. And so, um, yeah, that's what a probabilistic data structure is. A Bloom filter is a type of probabilistic data structure that kind of acts like a set. And so if you think of a set in a mathematical sense, you've got a set here, it's maybe got values foo, bar, and baz in it, right? And uh, on this set, we can do things. Um, we can add things, add things to a set. We added foo, bar, and baz just now. Uh, you can count the things in a set. You can, um, check and see if something exists in a set. Uh, you can remove things from a set. These are things that you can do on normal sets. A balloon filter is like a regular set, except you can only do addition, you can only add things to it, and you can check for existence. And those are the only operations you can do against it. And it's probabilistic, it has some uncertainty in it. And that comes from the fact that when you ask if it exists or not, sometimes it lies. Now it doesn't lie very often, and it lies rarely enough that you can use it for useful things. Much like a JPEG doesn't always give you a perfect rendition of the image, but it's good enough for what you need it for. And the way it lies is that it will say, when you ask if something exists, it'll say, no, it's not in the set. Or it will say, probably it is in the set. And so that's the probabilistic aspect of it. So either, no, it's definitely not in this set, or it's probably in the set, but it could be wrong. So how do these things work? Well, there's three main components to a balloon filter. You've got your bit vector. In a bit vector, it's just an array of bits, but ones and zeros, we all know what bits are, and nine. So that'll be 10. So that should be those values down here from zero. Bit vector, 10 bits wide in our example. And uh, all these values here, these, these numbers at the bottom, they represent the uh, index of this uh, bit vector, this array. And the top, we have the value. And since they're bits, they're gonna be ones or zeros. They start out as zeros. We also have a hash function. And this hash function is gonna take your data. It's gonna take a seed. This is just a, a number that's fed into it to make it unique. Feed both of these values into the hash function and it's gonna spit out some number. And so we've got a hash function. And uh, you might be thinking hash function, you might be thinking like SHA or something like that. Those are cryptographic hashes. You don't wanna use cryptographic hashes. You're gonna use something like a FNV or a murmur hash. They're uh, more performant. We're not trying to do encryption here. We're just trying to generate uniqueness. And then we need our seeds. We need a set of seeds. And so I'm gonna say, we're gonna do three of them. And we'll call them 11, 22, and 33. So with these three things, we can then start putting things into our bit vector, into our Bloom filter. The way this works is actually surprisingly simple. All you do is you take your data and you run it through the hash function. So hash, pass in the value, let's say foo here, pass in our seeds. So 11, 22, 33, and then that's gonna give us a number. 
n. Now, uh, we want to use that number as the index in this bit, ve bit uh, vector, and we're going to set the bits high wherever it's at. But this number is going to be like a 32-bit number. It's going to be too big. So we're going to take it through a modulus, and then we're going to get a smaller number of uh, something from 0 to 9, because we're going to do modulus 10 on it. But 10 is the width of this guy up here. And so when we do modulus 10, that should yield, let's just pick some numbers at random, let's say three, uh, five, and seven, All right? So we put a three, uh, one in the three position, one in the five position, and one in the seven position. Now, when we wanna to check to see if foo is in the, uh, the, the bloom filter, we run foo, we run it through with a hash, three times, one for each seed, get our numbers and we come up with the values three, five, and seven. And then we look and say, is three high? Yes, it is. Is five high? Yes, it is. Is seven high? Yes, it is. It's probably in the list. Let's do another one. We put bar in here. And when we put in bar, we ultimately get, let's say the numbers three, six, and nine. And I'm getting a little close to the edge there. I hope you can see that nine, the three, six, and nine. And so we go in here and we say it's three, we, we set it to high, okay. Set six to high, we set nine to high. You'll notice here that we've got a collision, right? The number three and the number three here are the same for both of these, these bits of data. But that's okay, that's why we have multiple seeds. It allows us to uh, avoid those collisions. And so we can say, well, you know, as long as all three of them match, we're good, keeps this from being a problem. So great, now if we go to check for bar, we get three, six, and nine back, three set, six set, nine set. It's great. If we look for, say, um, Baz, Baz has not been added to the balloon filter. And so uh, let's say it returns three, zero, and eight. Those are good numbers. Well, we've got this collision here, so that's a one. But zero and eight are not set. And so when we check for Baz, we know that it's never been added to the, to the, uh, to the bitmap. It's never been added to the bloom filter. It's not in the bit vector. And so we can definitively say, no, this is not in the bloom filter. But if we get a hash collision with Quux, and let's say we get three, six and seven, well, is it a comma there? That has created a collision here with the threes. It's collided with the six here, and it's collided with the seven here. And so three, six, and seven are all high. And so the answer is it's probably in the list, but it's not, we never added it. And so this is how this uncertainty can happen. This is how it says, no, we, we, if something's zero, it definitely has not been added to the balloon filter. But if something's set to all ones, it's probably been added, but we don't know that. That's kind of how they work internally. Um, one thing that you can do, you're, you're looking at this and you're saying, hey, you know, you've got these collisions. How can I keep these collisions from happening? Well, the short answer is, is that you can't. That's why they're probabilistic. But if you want to minimize them, you can increase the width of your bit array. You can make it a thousand bits or 10,000 bits. You can also increase the number of seeds that you use for your hashing function so you can get more numbers. And both of those will help avoid collisions. And there's a big complex formula that you can use to do this. Well, it's not big, but it's kind of hard to think about. And uh, fortunately, we don't have to think about it because Redis does that for us. So to use a balloon filter in Redis, there's really three commands you need to know. There's, there's five commands in total that are, are useful, but we'll cover three of them. And the first one is bf.reserve. And bf.reserve sets up a bloom filter. You don't have to use this. If you don't use it, you'll get the default values. Defaults are usually not what you want. So call bf reserve. Give it a key name. We're gonna call ours key because I'm imaginative. And then you pass in two values. You pass in an error, acceptable error rate. So in this case, I'm putting 1%, so 0.01. And you pass in how many items you anticipate putting in your bloom filter. 
So let's say 10,000. So these two values together can be used to compute the number of seeds and the width, the bit width. Very easy. You know what's an acceptable error rate for your application. You know how many things you think you're gonna put in there. So you provide those two values. Are there things that you as a developer, you as an application engine know already? Once you've created these things, you can call BF add, pass in your key, and then we're gonna add foo. And then we could add bar. If you wanted to add multiple things at once, there's actually a bf.mad multiple add. And so it works just like this, it's just dot M-A-D-D. And so you could do that all in one command. Then uh, once you've got some things in your bloom filter to use it, you call BF exists. So BF exists, you pass it a key and a value. You're saying is foo in the bloom filter? And it will say yes or no with a one or a zero coming back to you. The uh, corresponding multiple version of this is M exists and it works exactly the same, except you just say foo, bar, and baz like this. And um, yeah, that's pretty much all that you need to do to use a bloom filter in Redis. Um, way the worker, way more complicated. We've abstracted a lot of stuff for you. So you can just take use of this, uh, take advantage of this uh, data structure. Um, if you're curious, uh, an implementation of a bloom filter, I've got a couple that I've done. I did one in C Sharp and I did one in JavaScript for Node. Uh, there'll be links to those GitHub repos in the notes below. We'll have a link um, to uh, redisbloom.io uh, below as well, where you can install Redis Bloom, which is a module that extends Redis, and take advantage of this probabilistic data structure and a few others like it. So uh, that's all I got. Thanks a lot.